So, all right. How many of you moms like these Ferrer Rocher things? Anybody like those? Okay, I'll take them home. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, you, you kids, y'all come up here. If your mom is here, I want you to take her one of these, and we're not through. Um, hey, no, you're good. Let me get these. Now, how many... How many moms, we'll get to the flowers in a second here, uh, how many moms do not have a child here and you did not get one of these? Here, I'll be your son, okay? Uh, who else? Anybody else? Ah, uh, here we go. <laughs> I mean, we need two. Who else? Right. Really? Anybody else? We got a lot of this stuff left. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, we'll, we'll do something. We'll do something with that. We'll do something with those. All right. All right. Now, um, how many of you ladies like uh, yellow roses? How many moms? You like a yellow rose? Okay. Um, let's do this. Can I just bring these to you? Is that okay? All right. Happy Mother's Day to you. Well, I'm sorry. Here you go, John. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, wow. All right. What other mom likes yellow roses? Right here. All right. is struggling. There you go. Happy Mother's Day to you. All right. How many of you moms like uh, red roses? We have any left? Red. I've got one here. Okay. How about I give you that one? Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother. Anybody else? We got red? Pink? I just happen to have. It's kind of pink. Nathan, you want to run that back to Miss Irene? Thank you, man. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, is that it? Did everybody? Did every mom get a rose? Oh, right, I'm sorry, right here. What color? It doesn't matter. All right, let's give. And do you have a preference? Doesn't matter? Okay. There you go. Uh, who else? Christine, you didn't get a rose? You got one? Okay. Anna, what color? Yellow. Yellow. Okay. Every mom get uh, flowers and carbohydrates. Okay. I don't know what we're going to do with these. Uh, can you go put these in my car? <laughs> Moms, we love you. God bless you. Thank you so much for what you have done. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Matthew. This poor lady, we think we know who this is, but she's never named in the Bible. Uh, she has been run down and denigrated and griped about for what she did for a long time and 
we're going to take a look and see, is that really justified, what they said about her? Look in Matthew chapter number 20, beginning of verse number 17. If you're there, say amen. If you're not, say wait a minute. You got it. If you've got a Ryrie Study Bible, it's on page 1375. Go to Mark and turn left, and you'll run right into it. All right. Everybody there? All right. Verse 17. Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we, plural, go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Now, Jesus already knows, because he's God. He knows what's going to happen. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. So those three levels of attack he was aware of. And on the third day, he shall rise again. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children. We think this is Salome, but there's, there's no biblical evidence of it. The mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? What do you want? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? Now he's talking to the disciples, all of them. And apparently, uh, well, let's just finish reading. He says, I'm, can, can you be baptized with the same baptism I am going to be baptized with? And they, all the disciples, said, oh yeah. Now that's not King James, but they gave the Barney Fife answer, you know. Yeah, Angie, we're going to do that. We'll be there with you the whole way. Um, well, one time a little boy approached his dad one Sunday morning. Everybody was getting ready to go to church, but dad. And the little boy asked him, Dad, when will I be old enough not to have to go to church either? Um, you know, often that's the case in the American home. Mom is the one responsible for seeing that the kids go to church. She's the one that gets them up and gets them breakfast and gets them dressed. And mom is the one who's responsible seeing that her children are exposed to some level of spiritual influences and, and that they know the Bible. Uh, mom is the one that creates memories in her children's lives of who their Sunday school teacher was, uh, you know, who, the, who their pastor was, other people in the church. And, and these, are some, these are some great days that can be incorporated into the life of a child. And I'm just saying God bless the mothers who shoulder that responsibility faithfully. Uh, through the course of my ministry, I've seen many families where you, you, never, you never saw dad, but you saw mom regularly and consistently and faithfully bringing her kids to church and exposing them to um, biblical influences. And Matthew records for us the story of a mom and her children. As I mentioned, possibly Salome. But she remains uh, anonymous throughout Scripture. All she is known as is this, the mother of, of Zebedee's children. That's all we ever are given about this woman's identity. She's got two boys. And these children are James and John. They would be incredibly important figures in church history. They were going to go separate ways. They would experience some different things in life. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But she approaches Jesus one day and she says, Lord, can I, can I ask you a question? He says, sure. When you come into your kingdom, can, can Jim and John sit one on the left and one on the right in your kingdom? And boy, she has been criticized for that through, the, through history. Uh, man, who does she think she is? 
want her boys to sit on the left and on the right in, in the kingdom. And, um, but let's, let's look at this a little more closely, maybe a little more with, with, with eyes of reality. Number one, she came to Jesus. What better place for a mother to bring her children than Christ? Um, that's the best place in the world for anybody to be. And she understood that in order to get her children into the presence and under the influence of Christ, she had to bring them. She was the mother of Zebedee. And here's my question. Where's Zebedee? We'll find in an earlier chapter, Zebedee's on a boat fishing. He's fishing. Now, that was his business. This was not just some recreational weekend thing. This was his business. But he let his business just take over his life. And he left the spiritual dimension of his children's education up to his wife. And, and she did a good job. She knew the value of making sure that her children were exposed to the truth. Now, children are going to believe something. They are supremely moldable. You can tell a kid anything at an early enough age and he will believe it. He will believe that if you lose a tooth and put the tooth under the pillow. You know what I'm saying? The next morning, it's probably $5 now. They'll believe anything you tell them. Because they are, they are supremely moldable up to a point. And child psychologists tell us that by the time a child reaches ages 4 to 5 years old, they already know basically what they think is right and wrong by the time they're four or five years old. They've been exposed to enough of an influence somewhere to have already adopted that as their standard of behavior. And so if a child is raised around rebellious parents, he's going to think that's okay, that's normal. Um, oh, Stacy comes home and tells me some story about what's, what goes on at the school out there with anywhere from kindergarten, you know, third and fourth graders, and you know what I'm talking about. The stuff they say, the stuff they do, and you know they got it from home. They, they picked it up from the influences that are present in their lives. And so, but, but here was this woman. Here was the mother of Zebedee's children. She was a saved woman. She brought her kids. And don't you wish there were more ladies like this in our culture today that understand this is important. Now, there's nothing magic about this building. You know, this is, we could sell this building tomorrow and turn it into an auto parts store. All right? This is not the church, and so don't, don't say, where are you going tomorrow? Where are we going to the house of God? This is not the house of God. That's an Old Testament phrase. There was a house of God in the Old Testament, the temple and the tabernacle, but that's not what this is. We are the church, all right? People now constitute the body of Christ. And our children need to be around that influence. Uh, I, I, I think it is just absolutely vital, according to Scripture, that moms specifically have a right, close, intimate relationship with, that, with, with, with the Lord and that is going to be reflected in her relationship with her husband. There's no doubt about that. But she came to Christ. Anybody want to criticize that? I think she should have. She should have taken him to the movies. She should have went fishing with Zebedee. No, she should have went downtown and took him shopping. No, she came to Christ. Uh, so that's one thing that I think I have to say about this woman. Good job, ma'am. You brought your children to the right place. All right, now, here's the second thing. Not only did she come, she brought her kids with her. Um, a parent can want a lot of things for their children. They're good. You might want a college education for your children. You might want them to have status because of their name or their income or their, uh, their mentality. They're, maybe they're brilliant. Maybe they're great athletes. Maybe uh, you want them to wear, you know, the, the famous name brand 
diapers and, and tennis shoes and and it was a big deal in culture today what you what you wear and you know there may be moms and dad that is the most important thing is what you look like you got you got heavy hair perfect you got to have the right clothes and you got to have the right jewelry and and we just we want our kids to be a step above everybody else and and I'm just I'm telling you there are things in life that are more important than that much more important than that and I'm not just I'm not telling you, well, you know, if you bring them here, then automatically they're going to turn out all right. That, that is not the case at all. But I'm telling you, um, don't drop them off in the parking lot and go home and watch TV. Don't do that. Um, they need to see. But see, here's the deal. What you think is important, your children are going to absorb that. You ever notice that? That what, what parents do in moderation, children do to excess. They will take what you do and magnify it. They'll take what you do and do more of it. That's why there's this generational declension going on in America right now. Look at what is on TV now versus what was on TV 40, 50 years ago. Look at where we have slid. You say, well... Uh, it's just people can do what they want to do. You're, that's exactly what I'm saying. And when you take people, especially children, out from under the influence of the truth, you are going to create a vacuum in that, in that child's heart. Nature abhors a vacuum. And when a vacuum is created in the heart or the life of a person, something is going to fill that vacuum. And you probably won't like the aberrant morality that fills that vacuum. And so we've been given this wonderful opportunity, and moms especially, because you have this nesting instinct. And you have, you have especially those of you who have children at home, and they're, they're still relatively young. Oh, my word. What a position you are in to influence their thinking and their behavior for Christ. And so she... I mean, look at, look at what our kids do know a lot about. Look at, you know, the cartoons on TV. Um, every night and I watch Emma Grace, and, and she likes to watch some of these uh, shows on TV, and, and Chelsea's very careful about what she lets her watch. And some of this stuff, and she loves it, you know. I'm like, really? Whatever happened to Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner? And Foghorn Leghorn, and, you know, whatever, whatever happened to... Real cartoons, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so I mean, there, there's, just, there's just this loss of an anchor that is pandemic in our culture. So she, she brought her children to the Lord. I wish every home in America was a Christian home. I submit to you, politics can't save America. See, putting the right man in the White House can't save America. Passing the right laws, that won't save America. When people get their hearts right with God, when homes return to a biblical basis, that's what will save America. That's our responsibility. And so she brought her children. All right, now here's, here's the third thing. We're taking these very incremental steps. Why did she bring her children to the Lord? Well, she brought them for the purpose of worship. She didn't bring them there for a program or to play volleyball. There's nothing wrong with playing volleyball. We've got a volleyball net right out here. They, they didn't come to play games. She brought them to worship. We are to teach our children to worship. Now, the word worship has a couple of definitions. Uh, it's, a, it's a family of definitions, as a matter of fact. Uh, some of them you won't like. One of them in particular I don't think you'll like. Uh, one of them means to kiss the hand. And you guys that are extremely romantic, I'm, I'm sure you do this to, to your wives on a regular basis, you take her gently and you kiss her hand, right? That's a, that's a sign of, you know, you, you remember these old swashbuckling movies? You, you got, they're in the castle and here's Errol Flynn, you know, and he's doing this sword fighting thing with the bad guy. And there's always this beautiful girl at the top of the stairs. 
You know, and, and we know what they're fighting for. Her affections. And so here they're chicka, 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 chicka. And Errol Flynn always got the, the obligatory shot in the shoulder. You know, and now, oh, he's, he's dripping blood. And the bad guy's like, aha, aha, I've got him now. And Errol Flynn, you know, he would, he would take his sword and he would swap it through uh, a candle. And the guy would say, ah, you missed me. And Errol Flynn would take his sword and tick. And he cut that candle in half. And that guy didn't know it. And then eventually the bad guy gets killed. And, and Errol Flynn drags his bloody body up those steps. And he drops his sword. And then he takes that young lady's hand. And, and every woman in the theater went, ah. Oh. And every guy was like, oh, please. You know, I, I know what was going on. That's, what, that's one definition, to kiss the hand. Now, another one might not be quite as romantic. It means to act like a dog. That is part of the family of definitions of worship. Now, if you have a dog, that when you come home in the afternoon, that dog goes nuts. Anybody got a dog like that? All right. We used to have a little Jack Russell. And, oh, my word. Emma was her name, and I would go down to the, to the mailbox. So I was 100 feet from my garage door to the mailbox. And I'd go down and pick the mail up and come back, and Emma would just, she'd go nuts. She'd use the bathroom all over everything, and I'm like, Emma, Emma, Emma we should come, honey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be gone for 30 seconds. She was jumping, and she was twisting, and she was spinning, and she was whining and barking, and she didn't, she didn't care what she looked like. She didn't care, well, this looks stupid. She didn't care if it looked stupid. She just knew she was glad to see me. I expect the same behavior out of Stacy tonight when she gets off that airplane. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to go ahead now and, and pretend not to be disappointed in that. But anyway, what, what does that mean? Well, what if you, you guys, you've married and you're on, you're on a job that takes you away from home for a month. A month. And the day you come home, your wife's like, oh, hey. And she goes and brushes your teeth. And you're like, oh, hey? That's it? I've been gone a month and I get a, oh, hey? Now what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Worship should involve our heart are you glad what God's done for you? Oh, my goodness. Look at God. He has created a world. You eat the food God originally created. We drink the water God created. We enjoy the sunshine and the, and the, the cool weather and the breezes. God did all of this for us. I think that's something that we should be grateful for. Then he sent his son into the world to become us. He became sin for us. I think that deserves some worship. That deserves kissing of his hand. That, that involves and should involve me getting excited about what this great God has done for me. And so she brought her children to worship. Now, have you all ever heard of the principle of, uh, of implanting? Years ago, there was a movie that came out called Fly Away Home. Anybody ever see that movie, Fly Away Home? You know what it was about? You remember? This little girl, they lived like somewhere up north, I think, and, and uh, she had a, a female goose that laid some eggs, and, and something happened to the mom. Oh, she got killed or something. And the little girl put these eggs out in the barn in a box, and she put a light on them to incubate them, and she was there when they hatched. And as they began to break out of the shells, they saw her. And it's called imprinting. And God did this so that the, the baby would know who the mother was. Cattle do this. All right? And so these little ones looked at her, and guess what they thought she was? Mom. Exactly. And so wherever this girl went, <laughs> there's, there's a bunch of geese following her. Well, it got to be wintertime. And... That they weren't going to survive in the cold, and so they needed to migrate south. But they weren't going. They weren't going to migrate south because Mama wasn't migrating south. And so Daddy did something that was genius. He built a little ultralight plane, 
and painted the wings like goose feathers. And it's a true story. This, uh, this little girl, they took off, and here those, those geese are following, and news places all over from her home down, I think they finally wound up in Louisiana. Whenever she would land for fuel or food, news crews would just swarm out, and those, those geese would land. And it's called the principle of implanting. What those baby animals see for the first few moments of their life is what imprints them as parents. Now question, when our children are young, what do they, what do they get imprinted in their very souls from us? What do they see from mom and dad? Especially moms. Do they see worship and praise? So she brought her children to worship. Here's another thing. She wanted the absolute best for her sons. Um, one on the left hand, one on the right hand. I said, well, that, that's just pretty brazen, I think. Well, was she, was she mistaken in, in the possibility of that happening? Yes, yeah, she was mistaken. That was not going to happen. But what better place? What better place to have your children close to Christ? Now, this woman, who we think was Salome, but we, all we know is that she was the mother of Zebedee's children, this woman stayed faithful to the very end of everything. Look in the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew 27, beginning reading with verse number 55. Christ is on the cross. He is, he's just been just brutalized by flogging and all of this. Beginning in verse number 55, many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene. This Magdalene, she was from Magdala. And Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, Oh, and the mother of Zebedee's children. There she was at the foot of the cross. She was faithful to the very end. Um, now, if you were to ask her, all right, now you brought your kids to Christ. This is James and John, Jim and John. Um, you knew that this was a man that was going to be crucified. He was going to be hated. But you wanted your kids to emulate him. You wanted your kids to be like that. You wanted your kids to be close to this outcast. This guy that's going to be considered a criminal. He's going to be executed as a, as a criminal. Well, let me give you a little bit of, of an update here. What about James, ma'am? Well, James was beheaded for his testimony. Before they beheaded him, he was dragged through the streets behind horses. Herod Agrippa I ordered that this young man be tied behind a horse and run at high speed through stone streets. When that was over, they cut his head off. Now, ma'am, was it worth it? And then there's John. John was going to be put on a rocky island in the Mediterranean. It's called Patmos. He would never see his mother again. He was going to live on this rocky island. And he was going to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Take a pen in hand and write the book of Revelation. Question. Ma'am, was it worth it? You lost both your boys. You're the one that brought them to Christ. You're the one that taught them how to worship this one. You're, you're the one. 
Zebedee was on a boat fishing somewhere. You stayed faithful. Was it worth it, ma'am? What do you think she'd say? Do you think she would say, boy, if I had it to do again, I, I, I'd take him anywhere but that guy. I mean, this, this got James murdered and, and, and beheaded and, and then John was put on his penal colony and I never saw him again. W wow. No, I wouldn't do that. I, I don't think she would do that. I think she would say it was worth every drop of James's blood. It was worth it. It was worth all of the years that John spent on the island of Patmos, isolated as a prisoner of the Roman government. I... Um, in this whole story, though, there's a gap. There's a vacuum. And I think probably you've noticed the vacuum. Somebody's not in the family picture. We've got the mother, and we've got Jim, and we've got James. Daddy's not there. Dad's gone. That would have completed this picture. And I, I'm... So thankful for mothers who understand the important places to bring their children in life. I'm grateful for moms who understand that the greatest relationship that they can have is not, not for a rich spouse, but with the Lord Jesus Christ. I would be remiss if I did not thank my mother for her influence and the love that she had on my life. She died in 1977, the same day that Elvis Presley died. And I grieved more for my mom than I did Elvis Presley. I, uh, I, I don't know how she could have been a better mother. She was a pastor's wife. My dad was gone an awful lot. He was president of the Bible school that I went to and he was constantly in revival meetings and conferences and going on school business. And, uh, but you know, you know who was the most constant presence in my life and my brother's life? It was my mom. I had a great dad, but he was, he was just very busy. And later on, when he was bedridden, just before he died, me and my brother were in the bedroom and he said, boys, I need to ask your forgiveness. And he asked us to forgive him for being gone so much when we were kids. Well, of course, we forgave him. I wish he had been around more. That, that would have been great. So you have a short window of time. Just a short window. And time is closing that window a little more every day. And there are a lot of fun things that we can involve our kids in. The most important thing, introduce them to Christ. As I mentioned earlier, if we don't teach them to love the Lord, the, the world will teach them not to. That's our responsibility. And those moms that are here, thank you for, for being faithful in that. We honor you today. And here, this lady, I honor her. I think she was, she, she kind of lost her, her way a little bit by asking, you know, left and right, can they sit there? That was not, that, that wasn't going to happen. But I love the fact that she wanted them close to Christ. I love that. And being so close, they surrendered their lives to the Lord, and it cost both of them. I don't know that it won't happen in this generation either. So far it hasn't here in the United States, at least physically. But you young people that are here in this building today, if your mom has been faithful in this matter of exposing you to the Bible, teaching you the truth, seeing that you were in church, seeing that your relationship to the Lord started at a very early age. You have no clue what a gift 
that has been. You don't have a clue. One day, that the treasure of that giftedness is going to be exposed to you. And it might be at her funeral. You know, I wish, I wish I had done this. I wish I had said that. But one day, it's, it's going to be too late. So it just might be a great day today to tell your mom thank you. And here's what we're going to do. I want to open the floor for anybody that might want to stand. And, and don't take long. We don't have a great deal of time. And just give a thank you, Mom, for what you've done in my life. Anybody? Anybody? Got one right here. Amen. Bless you, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. 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 That sounds like tough spelled with a capital T, too. Uh, capital T. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. Anybody else? Thank you, Nathan. Anybody else? Wide open for anybody.
Thank you, Anna. My dad pastored the First Baptist Church in Greenville in the 50s. And I remember I was like three or four years old. We didn't have junior church. We didn't have nurseries. Kids sat in the auditorium. And there was a lady that had four or five kids. And they were just like little suck egg weasels. They just, just you know during church I mean just constantly you know slapping and hit and I was sitting with them one time and she was a nurse and she reaches up and she gets her purse and she pulls out a hypodermic needle and she looked down the road and she goes like that and all of a sudden they were all like bing 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 bing, bing. tough love you know, she wouldn't have used that, I don't think. But I wish and, and pray today that moms love your children enough to build borders around their lives because the world is after them. And you know that as well as I do. The world is after our young people. Let's not let them have them, okay? <laughs> Let's not do that. Father, we thank you today for your goodness. I want to thank you for the mother of Zebedee's children. I want to thank you for Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who stood around the cross while you were dying. Thank you for the women in history who have given birth to sons and daughters. And during the dark ages, 50 million of those sons and daughters were murdered because of their faith in Christ. I want to thank you for women who have stood by their husbands. Moms who have stood by their children, even when children did stupid things, wrong things, immoral, illegal things. And moms have loved and they've clung to. And thank you, thank you, thank you. All they have done has been a representation of your love for us. And we recognize that today and thank you for your goodness in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you dismiss us now. Your love, and your keeping, and uh, make us living translations of the truths of your book. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Be back tonight, 6 o'clock. All right, God bless you. Y'all have a great week.